again, which is very, very important. And that is why I think the obstetricians are given more importance because this is something needs to be really handled by the obstetrician. Otherwise, uh, things may really go haywire. Every word and every paragraph, every table of this guideline is a potential uh, source for becoming SBA or becoming an EMQ. And as I said, this is again very important for your clinical practice. So uh, this will is really important to know this guideline because it can also be useful in cases of litigations. Uh, guys, uh, this guideline is only, not only important for the MR surgery candidates but for other clinical practitioners as well. And that is why uh, this will be uploaded at the maximum sites available so that everyone who is interested in knowing what is there in the RCOG guideline and what does the RCOG tell about going ahead with PPH, uh, they can go ahead and watch this video. So let me start with the definition of primary postpartum hemorrhage. Primary postpartum hemorrhage is the most common form of major obstetric hemorrhage. The traditional definition of primary hemorrhage is the loss of 500 ml or more blood from the genital tract within 24 hours of the birth of baby. Okay. Now this can be divided into three types. One is so, so there are two types initially. So one is minor and the other one is major, whereas the major can be again divided into moderate and severe. So minor is 500 ml to 1000 ml, whereas major is anything more than 1000 ml. From 1000 ml to 2000 ml is called as moderate. From more, anything more than 200 ml is called as severe. Okay. So this is the basis of uh, calling it a primary hemorrhage. Let me repeat again. Minor is 500 ml to 1000 ml. Major is anything more than 1000 ml. Moderate major is 1000 ml to 2000, whereas severe is more than 2000 ml. Secondary PPH is defined as an abnormal or excessive bleeding from birth then on between 24 hours and 12 weeks postnatal. So secondary PPH has been extended up to 12 weeks postnatal. The risk factors for PPH may represent antenatally or they may be present in, in the intrapartum. So you should be aware, if you know the risk factors, you can find out what measures can help you if you, de you have to deal with PPH at some point of time. So care plans must be modified as and when the risk factors arise. Clinicians must be aware of the risk factors of PPH and should take into account when counseling women about the place of delivery. Women with known risk factors for PPH should only be delivered in the hospital with a blood bank on site. So as I told you that not all the patients in NHS in UK are delivered in the hospital. The low risk patients are managed by midwives and can have home delivery. And this is for them that only if they have high risk factors and only if they are high risk, they need to be delivered in the hospital. Okay. Causes of PPH as related to abnormalities of one or more of the four basic processes. There are four T's, tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin. These are the uh, basic reasons why PPH may occur. 
the most common of this is the tone and uterine or toning right now the guideline gives us a very nice chart wherein they have given us the risk factors they have told in which of the four p's does that risk factor fall and they have given the or that is the odds ratio of that risk factor so i have marked that remember they generally ask about the one which has got the highest impact and uh, or the one which is which is very commonly present and the one with the least uh, incidence okay so retain placenta has got the maximum or then the second one is prolonged third stage of labor okay guys remember the last one to appear is perineal laceration so this is the one with the least odds ratio so just remember that retained placenta is has got the highest risk of being associated with pph then is the prolonged third stage of labor and then is perineal uh, the and the, the least one is perineal laceration there is no ertony uh, here and the reason is that is the most common reasons as already mentioned now this antenatal anemia should be investigated and treated appropriately as this may reduce the morbidity associated with pph hemoglobin levels outside the normal uk range for pregnancy which is in the first contact that is at the first visit patient should have the hemoglobin of around 110 grams per liter and at 28 weeks she should have the hemoglobin of 10.5 grams per liter so the hemoglobin levels outside the normal uk range for pregnancy should be investigated and iron supplementation considered if indicated so anything less than that should be started with iron supplementation it is recommended that parental iron therapy should be considered antenatally for women with iron deficiency anemia who do not respond to oral iron so again remember first thing is the oral iron supplementation and the second thing is to step wise move ahead with the parenteral iron therapy how to minimize the risk now reducing the blood loss at delivery is important how can we do that uterine massage is of no benefit in the prophylaxis of pph and remember because this is something that uh, we practice and this is something which has uh, which is done almost by every gynec or every obstetrician so remember it has got no benefit in the prophylaxis of pph prophylactic uterotonics should be routinely offered in the management of third stage of labor in all women as they reduce the risk of pph for women without risk factors for pph delivering vaginally oxytocin 10 units intramuscularly is the agent of choice for prophylaxis in the third stage of labor we know that once the baby is delivered vaginally and we have to give her active stage active labor uh, third stage of labor we give 
oxytocin and the dose is 10 units. For women delivering by caesarean section, oxytocin 5 international units by slow intravenous injection should be used to encourage contraction of the uterus and to decrease the blood loss. So remember there's a change in the dose vaginally as well as by caesarean section. So if vaginally it is uh, the patient delivers, it's 10 international units, whereas the dose of oxytocin for caesarean section is five international units IV, okay? Ergometrin oxytocin has been used uh, as one of the uh, one of the measures to control hemorrhage. It is actually called as centometrin injection. But remember, this is very much important uh, to remember that whenever you're giving centometrin, you have to rule out preeclampsia and pH. For women at risk of hemorrhage, it is possible that combination of preventive measures might be superior to syntocinon alone to prevent PPH. Clinicians should consider the use of intravenous tra tranexamic acid. So remember that also, that intravenous tranexamic acid, the dosage is 0.5 to 1 grams. In addition to oxytocin, at caesarean section, to reduce the blood loss in women at increased risk of PPH. So these are all the measures of minimizing the risk. So remember the prophylactic uteral tonics that we already discussed at the normal delivery or at the caesarean section. Then they have told about the syntocinone and then they have told about the use of tranexamic acid in addition to oxytocin at scissor infection. Moving ahead, there is another uh, form of oxytocin that is called as carbitocin, which is a longer acting oxytocin derivative. Carbitocin is licensed in UK specifically for the indication of prevention of PPH in context of caesarean deliveries. 100 micrograms can be given IV bolus over one minute and should be used for prevention of PPH in elective caesarean deliveries. Remember that for a nice caesarean section, they recommend oxytocin five international units by slow IV as we have already seen for prophylaxis for caesarean delivery. So carbitocin is not yet recommended by nice but they have said that it may be useful. Identification of severity of hemorrhage. Clinicians should be aware that the visual estimation of peripartum blood loss is inaccurate and the clinical signs and symptoms should be included in the assessment of PPH. As visual estimation often underestimates the blood loss, more accurate methods may be used, such as blood collection creeps for vaginal deliveries and weighing swaps. So the first thing is we should know how much the patient has bled, right? So they have said that the blood collection drips, weighing swaps may be useful. Written and pictorial guidelines may help the staff working in labor to estimate the blood loss. So they train the, the staff to find out and to uh, measure how much the blood loss is, but there is no perfect way okay, that they have mentioned. In pregnancy, pulse and blood pressure are usually maintained in the normal range until the blood loss exceeds 1,000 ml. Tachycardia, tachypnea, and slight recordable fall in the systolic blood pressure occur with the blood loss of 1,000 to 1,500. So they have mentioned these signs to find out what might be the, the exact blood loss. So this is only for the estimation of the blood loss. So remember, guys, until uh, the patient has bled one liter until then generally the pulse and the blood pressures are maintained whereas tachycardia tachypnea and fall in the systolic BP starts when the patient has lost from 1000 to uh, 1500 ml a systolic BP below 80 is associated with worsening tachycardia tachypnea and altered mental state 
usually indicates a PPH ex in excess of 1,500 mm. In non-pregnant patients, the shock index calculated from the heart rate by systolic blood pressure has been employed as an early marker of hemodynamic compromise. Okay, so they have mentioned uh, about all the signs that go with the with the loss of blood as it increases, and they have mentioned that in non-pregnant, the shock index is can be a marker of hemodynamic compromise. Now remember, communication with the patient and her birthing partner is very important, and it should be it is really important to give them all the information about what is going to happen and what is happening with the patient. So taking them in confidence is again given more importance in RCUG. Relevant staff with an appropriate level of expertise should be alerted of PPH. The midwife in charge and the first line obstetric and anesthetic staff should be alerted when women present with minor PPH without clinical shock. A multidisciplinary team involving the senior members of the staff should be summoned to attend to women with major PPH and ongoing bleeding or clinical shock. In minor PPH, the first line staff should be alerted and major PPH, the following member of staff should be called in and summoned. So this is again important from the point of view of questions that are asked. So who are the people that needs to be called in major PPH? An experienced midwife in addition to the midwife in charge, obstetric middle grade, anesthetic middle grade, on-call clinical hematologist with experience in major hemorrhage, portals of delivery of specimen and blood. All these people are summoned and they should be present at major PPH. The consultant obstetrician, the consultant anesthetist should be alerted and the blood transfusion laboratory should be informed. One member of the team should be assigned for recording the events, fluids, drugs, blood components, whatever is transfused. So a scriber is really important. And remember the RCG recommends that the consultant obstetrician should attend the person when there is a PPH of more than 1,500 ml, where the hemorrhage is continuing. Now going ahead with the resuscitative measures for minor PPH as well as uh, for major. So for the minor PPH without the clinical shock, IV access of 114 gauge cannula is important. And what do we do this when we take out around 20 ml of blood? One is the group and screen. Second is the full blood count. Coagulation screen, including the fibrinogen pulse respiratory rate and BP recording every 15 minutes should be commenced and there should be warm crystalloid infusion. Okay, so these are the resuscitative measures for minor PPH. So remember you only have to do blood group screen and full blood count and you have to do, do coagulation screen including the fibrinogen. Majors for major PPH involves full protocol of major PPH, blood loss greater than 1000 ml, continuing to bleed or patient with clinical shock. We start with ABC, that is assessing the airway and breathing, evaluating the circulation, positioning the patient flat, keeping the woman warm, using appropriate available measures, transfusing the blood as soon as possible, if clinically required until the blood is available, infuse up to 3.5 liters of warm clear fluids. Initially, two liters of warmed isotonic crystalloids should be given. Further, there is fluid resuscitation with additional isotonic crystalloid or colloid, that is succinylated gelatin, Hydroxyethyl star should not be used. The best equipment available should be used to achieve the rapid warmed infusion of fluid. Special blood filters should not be used as they slow the infusion. This is the most important 
tables that needs to be remembered every word is important crystalloids to be used are up to 2 liters of isotonic crystalloid 1.5 liters of colloid until the blood arrives so these are the the fluids that needs to be given in the initial part for the blood if immediate transfusion is indicated then group o recess d negative k negative can be used and rbcs they are given in the form of rbcs switch to the group specific red cells as soon as feasible ffp administration of ffp should be guided by hemostatic testing and whether hemorrhage is continuing if prothrombin or aptt are prolonged and hemorrhage is ongoing administer 12 to 15 ml per kg of ffp if the hemorrhage continues after 4 units of rbc and hemostatic tests are unavailable administer 4 units of ffp platelet concentrates administer one full of platelet if hemorrhage is continu continuing and the platelet is less than 75 into 10 raised to 9 per liter cryo precipitate administer two pools of cryo precipitate if hemorrhage is ongoing and the fibrinogen is less than 2 g per liter a high concentration of oxygen that is around 10 to 15 liters per minute via the face marks should be administered regardless of maternal oxygen concentration establish two that is 14 gauge iv lines and take out a blood sample of 20 ml which should involve the full blood count coagulation screen urea and electrolytes and to cross match the packed red cells of four units the urgency and measures undertaken to resuscitate and arrest hemorrhage need to be tailored to the degree of shock okay so remember all the numbers here and any number has the potential to become an sba the cornerstone of resuscitation is restoration of the blood volume and the oxygen carrying capacity so this is very important to maintain uh or to revive the patient and help the patient with resuscitation so remember you have to maintain the blood volume you have to maintain the oxygen carrying capacity and on the goals up to which you should be going or the therapeutic goals which should be attained attempt uh are hb greater than 8 grams sorry hb greater than 80 grams per liter or we may just say 8 grams per dl platelet count greater than 15 into 10 raised to 9 per liter so thrombin time of time of less than 1.5 times normal aptt less than 1.5 times normal fibrinogen greater than 2 grams so these are the main therapeutic goals which should be attained and try you need to keep on giving the majors or you need to keep on resuscitating the patient until these are uh, maintained blood transfusion there is no firm criteria for initiating the red blood transfusion the decision to provide blood transfusion should be based on both the clinical and the hematological assessment so remember if they ask you what is the criteria for blood transfusion the answer is there is no firm criteria and it actually depends on the clinical and the hematological assessment the repeated measurements of serum lactate and base deficit together with hematocrit are made during hemorrhage and resuscitation to assess the tissue perfusion and oxygenation so we have to keep on doing the serum lactate and the base deficits and uh, we need to keep an eye on that okay so that is again they have said that it is important to keep on doing that to assess the tissue perfusion and the oxygenation 
the selection of red cells red cell units for transfusion how do we do that so the major obstetric hemorrhage protocols must include provision of emergency blood with immediate issue of group o rh negative k negative with a switch to blood group specific as soon as possible so if you have an emergency start with o negative so start with o blood group o with rh negative that means o negative and k negative blood okay if the clinic if clinically significant red blood cells antibodies are present close liaison with transfusion laboratory is essential to avoid delay in transfusion in life threatening hemorrhages all delivery units especially the small units without a blood bank on the side should maintain a supply of o negative blood intraoperative cell salvage should be considered for emergency use in pph associated with cesarean section and with vaginal delivery so remember the first thing that should be asked for is the o negative k negative blood if uh, the the next thing that needs to be maintained or you may use is called as intraoperative cell salvage and using the uh, using the the intraoperative cell salvage has also been shown to be very much beneficial uh, when the patient is suffering from severe major pph pregnant women who are rh negative must only receive rh negative to avoid a uh, d allo immunization according unless a woman is known to be k positive only k negative in women of child bearing age all delivery units especially the small units without a blood bank on site should maintain a supply of group o negative as might offer the only means of restoring oxygen capacity oxygen carrying capacity with an acceptable time scale okay so they have just explained what we have discussed in the first two slide now remember this is about cross matching versus the electronic issue of blood and they have said that the hospital transfusion laboratories can readily provide red cells that are abo and rh d compatible using the electronic issue with no cross matching needed provided that the patient does not have any antibodies and there are robust automated system in place for antibody testing and identification of the patient in unforeseen hemorrhage group o rh negative k negative units must be immediately available for emergency use with a switch to group specific blood as soon as feasible in elective transfusion in the antenatal period cmv zero negative products should be used to avoid transmission of cmv to the fetus so this is cytomegalovirus in an emergency such as pph a standard leukocyte depleted component should be given to avoid delay and cmv negative blood or platelets are not needed for transfusion during delivery or in postpartum hemorrhage so the, again this is an important thing to be remembered intraoperative cell salvage is the process whereby the blood shed during the operation is collected filtered and washed to produce the autologous red blood cells for transfusion to the patient is commonly being used in cardiac orthopedic vascular surgeries with a relative reduction in the blood transfusion of 38% and an absolute reduction of 21% it has been proposed that cell cell wash should be considered for emergency use okay the methods to assess the hemostatic impairment during pph include clinical observation the laboratory tests are pt prothrombin time aptt clot fibrinogen platelet count the point of care testing uh, is also to be considered so remember coagulopathies may involve rapidly and repeating tests during continued bleeding and observation of trends are more useful than single measurement so every 30 minutes the the testing needs to be done they include the testing of pt aptt clot fibrinogen and platelet count 
plus fibrin region should always be measured as a part of routine coagulation screen because it falls early and may be reduced to the clinical significant level despite normal pt and apt so remember plus fibrin region is uh, a major part or is uh, an important thing that needs to be measured during during the routine coagulation screen platelet number should be measured as a part of full blood pack point of care testing using the visco is elastometry such as thromboelastography that is teg or rotational thromboelastometry combined with an aggregate treatment algorithm has been associated with decreased blood loss and blood product use both outside and within the obstetric setting nice has concluded that there is insufficient evidence to recommend the routine adoption of visco visco elastometric point of care in the management of tph if used a quality control protocol should be agreed with the hematology laboratory okay so uh, we cannot use it routinely they have said but uh, if it is used the quality control measures or the protocol should be used how to transfuse the ffps there is uh, the ffps should be infused at the dose of 12 to 15 ml per kg if no hemostatic tests are available early ffp should be considered for conditions with suspected coagulopathy such as placental abruption or amniotic fluid embolism or where the detection of tph has been delayed if pt and apt is more than 1.5 times normal and hemorrhage is ongoing volumes of ffp in excess of 15 ml per kg are likely to be needed to correct the coagulopathy clinicians should be aware that these blood components must be ordered as soon as needed and uh, as the need for them is anticipated as there will always be a short delay in supply because of the need of thawing okay so they have uh, said that uh, the dose is around 12 to 15 ml per kg and they have said that you may summon uh, ffp little early in cases of uh, amniotic fluid embolism or in cases of placental abruption with severe bleeding okay the drawbacks of early ffp are that major uh, majority of women with pph will have normal coagulation at the time of administration and that is associated with increased risk of taco that is transfusion associated circulatory overload so when we give it very early it may cause uh, an overload and it may even cause a transfusion related acute lung injury if hemorrhage is ongoing and uh, the last pt aptt results are available prolonged and are prolonged 12 to 15 ml of uh, per kg of ffp should be requested and used with the aim of maintaining the pt aptt at less than 1.5 times per normal if the results of hemostatic tests are not available and the hemorrhage is continuing after four units of rbc have been transfused ffp should be infused at the dose of 12 to 15 ml per kg so they have to, uh, told how to go ahead uh, in a normal uh, uh, way um, uh, in a normal condition wherein you are having a pph where you are facing pph so Uh, remember if the tests are not available and you still have hemorrhage you have to start with four units of rbcs then ffp should be infused at the dose of 12 to 15 ml per kg 6 is to 4 that the rbc is to ffp transfusion maintained until tests of hemostasis are available such empirical use of ffp is in line with the published guidance ffp transfusion earlier than this could be considered for placental abruption or amniotic fluid embolism that we have seen because these situations are associated with early coagulopathy or if the diagnosis of pph has been delayed so therein you can use early pph ffps in rare cases of massive bleeding where women have been given eight or more units of rbcs and they continue to bleed and still there is no coagulation results or platelet counts are available then two pools of cryoprecipitate and one pool of platelet should be infused fibrinogen level of greater than 2 g should be maintained during ongoing pph 
prescribed precipitate should be used for fibrinogen replacement. It is expected that two pools of cryoprecipitate, one pool is made is taken up from five donors, would increase the fibrinogen levels by one gram per liter. Increasing the fibrinogen level by one gram per liter requires 60 milligrams per kg of fibrinogen concentrate. Okay. Remember these numbers that two pools of cryoprecipitate and one pool is taken up from five donors. There is an increase by of uh, one gram per liter with two pools of cryoprecipitate. Transfusion of platelets. Now remember the target is 75 into 10 raised to 9 per liter, and uh, the trigger is uh, uh, there is a general consensus that platelets should be transfused at a trigger of 75 into 10 raised to 9 to maintain a level of greater than 50 into 10 raised to 9 during the ongoing PPH. Okay, so the platelet should be maintained above 75 into 10 raised to 9. The routine use of recombinant factor 7a is not recommended in the management of major PPH unless as part of clinical trial. Now, recombinant factor 7a is an expensive product and that is licensed for UK for the treatment of bleeding episodes in patients with specific inherited bleeding disorders. Its effectiveness is markedly diminished by hypothermia, acidosis, low platelets. So effective resuscitation towards normal physiology is a prerequisite of its use. A study investigating the safety of recombinant factor 7a when employed on an off-label basis to treat life-threatening hemorrhage found a significant increase in the risk of arterial but not venous thromboembolic events when compared with placebo. And that is why it is not recommended routinely. The use of R recombinant factor 7a may be considered for treatment of life-threatening PPH and should not be delayed or should be considered as a substitute for life-saving procedures like embolization or surgery or transfer to the referral center. Going ahead with the main protocol of monitoring and investigating the major PPH, you have to start with the cross-matching, then the full blood count coagulation screen, renal and liver function test, monitor the temperature every 15 minutes, continuous pulse, BP, and respiratory rate monitoring, ECG and automated blood pressure recording should be done, police catheter to monitor the urine output, two peripheral cannulae, 14 gauge, consider arterial line monitoring, once appropriately uh, experienced staff available for insertion, so central line needs to be put in, uh, consider transfer to intensive therapy unit once the bleeding is controlled and or the monitoring at high dependency unit on delivery suits if appropriate. Recording of parameters on modified or early obstetric warning charts that is MEO's, uh, MEO's chart acting and ex escalating promptly when abnormal scores of MEO's chart are observed. Documentation of fluid balance, blood, blood products and other procedures. So this is again, uh, we know that there is a score chart wherein, wherein we measure how much is the input and output and what all uh, uh, are the vital signs of that patient, right? Now, once the bleeding is arrested and the coagulopathy is corrected, thromboprophile axis is administered as there is a high risk of thrombosis. Uh, in these patients. Alternatively, you may start with anti-embolism. Stockings to temples devices or intermittent pneumatic compression devices can be used if chemical thromboprophylaxis is contraindicated, okay? Uh, like in cases of thrombocytopenia. So remember, thromboprophylaxis is again very important though the patient uh, has had bleeding. So after that, it's important to uh, give importance to uh, how to maintain or how to prevent uh, thrombosis. The management of PPH requires multidisciplinary team. Uh, this involves the anesthetic. Now remember, anesthetist is really important here for uh, a senior anesthetist specifically. And the reason is uh, they help in main, uh, the, the central lines as well as to initiate and continue the prompt resuscitation of the patients. And they also have expertise in fluid and transfusion therapy. Central neuraxial anesthesia has become the anesthetic technique of choice for, in the obstetric population. This has resulted in the reduction on the maternal mortality. Remember that while general anesthesia in obstetric patients is associated with increased morbidity and mortality when compared to regional anesthesia, 
due to physiological changes that occur in pregnancy it may be preferable who in those patients only who are hemodynamically unstable and who have viable pathway so uh, central neuralgia anesthesia is the anesthesia of choice if they ask you in the questions and general anesthesia only in patients who are hemodynamically unstable or who have viable pathway when uterine atony is perceived to be the cause of bleeding then the sequence of mechanical and pharmacological measures should be instituted in turn until the bleeding stops and the most common cause of pph is uterine atony we just saw the following measures should be instituted or administered in turn so what are the things once pph is established or once you are you are diagnosing a pph what are the things that you need to do first thing is rubbing up of the fundus that is palpating the fundus and starting to rub second thing is ensure that the bladder is empty oxytocin 5 units by slow iv injection ergometrin 0.5 mg by slow iv injection or im injection and remember it needs to be contraindicated so rule out the uh, preeclampsia or hypertension oxytocin infusion 40 units in 500 ml of isotonic crystalloids at 125 ml per hour unless fluid restriction is necessary carboprost 0.25 mg by intramuscular injections repeated at the interval of not less than 15 minutes to a maximum of 8 doses remember carboprost is not given in patients with asthma so so ask that history again before giving carboprost and mesoprost 800 micrograms sublingually so this is the chronology of uh, the medications that you should be using in pbh if significant autonic hemorrhage continues after the third dose of carboprost without any significant improvement the team should consider transfer to the operating theater so though they have said that you may use up to eight doses after third dose you should start uh, taking the patient to the operation theater because then there is more need of the patient needing laparotomy and hysterectomy if the pharmacological measures fail to control the hemorrhage surgical intervention should be initiated and one of them is intrauterine balloon tamponade it is an appropriate first line surgical intervention for most women where uterine atony is the only main cause of hemorrhage conservative surgical interventions may be inter attempted as the second line depending on clinical circumstances and available expertise it is recommended that a laminated diagram of breast sutures should be kept in the theaters and resort to hysterectomy sooner rather than later so these are the recommendations that are written at and uh, in the uh, um in bold letters in the guideline okay so that uh, so that is why they have they have just mentioned the points there ideally and when feasible a second experienced clinician should be involved in the decision of hysterectomy so let us see what exactly is you try and balloon tamponade now they have said that tamponade using various methods of hydrostatic balloon catheter has to superseded the uterine packing and controlling atonic pph and the different types of pulleys buckley balloon sing stack and blake mold esophageal catheter or a condom catheter urological rush balloon has been described as preferable by what easy uh, to use and low cost a, a detailed protocol of uterine tamponade using a rush balloon is available the success rate of balloon tamponade is a around 91% and what is a tamponade test a positive test indicates that the laparotomy is not required whereas negative means that you have, will have to uh, go to a uh, laparotomy the concept of balloon tamponade as a test serve to affirm its place as the first line surgery for the hemostasis and ideally it should be removed during the daytime hours and because, so, so that everybody is available and just in case the patient has a uh, pph again uh, you may uh, there will be staff available to help you there okay then they have said that b lynch sutures or the hemostatic sutures are very important and you may go proceed with that double vertical compression sutures have been used have been proved to be effective and these sutures uh, have the success rate of around 70% so remember also the little negative the success rate of
percent. Now, then again, they have mentioned about the stepwise uterine devascularization and the internal iliac artery ligation. And the steps are the first one uterine artery ligation is changed one by one. When internal iliac artery ligation is being considered, a senior gynecologist or vascular surgeon should be informed. So, again, this is a question that can be asked in EMQs. I remember there the fertility outcomes following the surgical management of PPH concluded that uterine devascularization techniques, uh, including the internal uh, iliac ligation, did not adversely affect the future fertility. Selective arterial occlusion or embolization by interventional radiology for the treatment of PPH suggests that intervention does not impair the subsequent menstruation, fertility, or obstetric outcomes. And selective arterial occlusion may also be effective after failed internal iliac artery ligation. And the last one is hysterectomy. You need to have another consultant's opinion before going for hysterectomy. Early recourse to hysterectomy is recommended, especially when there is bleeding with placenta accreta or uterine rupture. Remember, the choice is of subtotal hysterectomy in the operation uh, in many instances of PPH requiring a hysterectomy unless there is a trauma to the cervix or morbidly adherent placenta in the lower segment. So if you have a question of type of hysterectomy, uh, obstetric hysterectomy or hysterectomy during caesarean section, you have to mention it's subtotal. Now, coming to secondary PPH, we know that there are different uh, reasons uh, why secondary PPH occurs, and one of them is infection, one of them is written placenta, isn't it? So, uh, in women presenting with secondary PPH, the assessment of vaginal microbiology should be performed, and appropriate use of antimicrobial therapy should be initiated when endometritis is suspected. A pelvic ultrasound may help to exclude the presence of retained products of conception, although the diagnosis of retained products is unreliable. Surgical evaluation of retained placental tissue should be undertaken or supervised by experienced clinician. Cause of secondary PPH are numerous and it includes RPOCs, subinvolution, endometritis. Management of women with secondary PPH should include assessment of the hemodynamic status and assessment of the blood loss. Combination of clindamycin and gentamicin is appropriate and that once uncomplicated endometritis has clinically improved with intravenous therapy, there is no additional benefit from further oral therapy. Okay, Spelvic ultrasound scans may be required to see whether the patient has got any RPOCs. Uh, a surgical evacu evacuation of the uterus for RPOC is not without morbidity and can result in uterine perforation. That is around 1.5% and Asherman syndrome. So it is that is why really important to recommend that surgery, surgical eva uh, evacuation of the retained placental tissue should not should be undertaken under the supervision of experienced clinician. Okay, so remember this again. This is an important point. And appropriate, uh, appropriately trained clinician may consider performing uterine evacuation under direct USG guidance. Eutrotonics such as mesoprost, ergometrin have been recommended in the management of secondary PPH, although evidence to support to their use is limited. Transcatheteral atrial embolization and balloon tamponade have been employed only when in the secondary PPH, only when there is ongoing bleeding and bleeding not stopping with all the Every maternity unit should have a multidisciplinary protocol for management of PPH, all the staff in the maternity care should receive training in the management of obstetric emergencies. The training should be multi-professional. There should be team rehearsals. RCG recommends that all cases of PPH with an estimated blood loss of more than 1.5 liters or 1,500 ml should be reviewed and there should be incident reporting of these cases. Debriefing is again a very important part um, of uh, this guideline. And remember that unless you have a debriefing, you may face a litigation. So an opportunity to discuss the event surrounding the obstetric hemorrhage should be offered to the women and to, uh, at the mutu mutually convenient time. So do it only after the patient is um, uh, has survived uh, PPH and is fine now. And again, debriefing of the team is very important. It is important to record the staff in attendance and the time they have arrived. So documentation of all these things is very important. The sequence of events, the administration of different pharmacological uh, agents, the time of surgical interventions, the condition of the mother throughout the different steps, and the time of fluid and blood pressure. So this is important from the point of view of clinical governance. And this again, 
taken a chart and they have just given a stepwise uh, uh, protocol or algorithm of how to go ahead. So if you face a major hemorrhage, call for help. First thing, senior midwife. So we have discussed who all needs to be called. Then start with the resuscitation. We have discussed that, that also. Okay, so once the fluid balance, blood transfusion, blood tests are given, there are two things that needs to be done at the same time. So one will be doing only the monitoring uh, and doing the investigations, whereas the other one, other team will be dealing with the medical treatment, right? So the medical treatment we have already discussed, and if that doesn't help, then the next thing to help here is the, the surgery, surgery, and uh, we have discussed even that. So balloon tamponade going for the breast sutures, and if not, going for the devascularization of uh, the vascular uh, of the uh, vessels and then going for the ligation of internal iliac artery and the last course is again of course hysterectomy in the post care keep the patient in high dependency unit or intensive care so that is a big guideline but every word is really important if you try and practice and read the guideline once or twice you will remember each and every important part though this was a big session i have tried to involve all the sentences that have the potential to become SBA or to become EM2 and that is why I have tried not to skip and I have not only used the tables to be mentioned or to be told to use so remember I have put in the lines which have all the potential to become SBA and EM2 and that is why go through this uh, presentation once or twice uh, so that you remember every line and every word because I have to uh, in this uh, video i have also involved the people that needs to be summoned who is to be called before doing what remember the second clinician is important uh, before going for hysterectomy so all those points are important even uh, uh, with your uh, uh, ways 